Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for attending our webinar today by UCL. I welcome you and we go to the next slide. Um, so our webinar is entitled Why Study the EU from London, a world-class education in practice and scholarship at UCL. And we want to show you today how we study and how we teach the EU at UCL. And first of all, I want to introduce our team on the next slide. My name is Dr. Christopher Vratil. I'm lecturer in European politics at the UCL School of Public Policy, and I have two colleagues with me today. Hi, I'm Oliver Gerstenberg. I'm associate professor at UCL Laws. Hello, everybody. Hello, and my name is uh, Dr. Uta Steiger. I direct the European Institute at UCL and I'm Provost Provost for Europe as well. Great, and then we go to the next slide. And here, before we tell you what we offer you at UCL, we would first like to hear a bit about your expectations with regard to graduate study on the EU. And for this, we have set up a Mentimeter survey. So we encourage you all to go on www.menti.com and then put in the code 1062033. -03. But also, I'm just now putting into the chat a direct link so just use this direct link and go on, on our, go on our survey and tell us what your expectations are with regard to graduate study. Um, has anyone already like tried the link? If so, um, please um, let me know in the chat whether it's working. Otherwise, we will resend um, the link. But you can also just use www.menti.com and then the code 1062033. Okay, um, while you are telling us a bit about your expectations, we will tell you a bit more about our offer at UCL. And for this, we want to take you to an idea that um, Donald Puhala, a political scientist, had in the 1970s about the study of Europe. And he said, well, the study of the European Union by scientists is really as if you have blindfolded scientists you know, that study an elephant. And if you can imagine like now um, Oliver and Uta and me as blindfolded scientists coming from different disciplines, we might stand around this elephant, someone touching the trunk, someone touching a leg, someone touching just the skin. And if we were just touching these parts blindfolded, no of the elephant. And each of, un, each of us on our own, we wouldn't like really grasp the you. But if we were talking to each other afterwards, no, we would probably um, understand and um, put our views together and understand, oh, we are looking at an elephant. And this is exactly um, what our approach to studying um, the US at UCL. We have an interdisciplinary approach. And how that works, we want to illustrate to you with a case study. And this case study is on democratic backsliding. Democratic backsliding has been a major concern in the European Union, as many of you may, have, uh, may know. And I will give you a political science perspective, and there I will ask what political interests and institutions make democratic backsliding possible? And, are, then, and are there any judicial remedies against backsliding, as the lawyers would ask? And uh, from the European Institute perspective, we would bring to the table how the EU reacts in practice and how practitioners approach the problem. Great. And let's look at this. So if, if you were coming to UCL and we would talk about democratic backsliding, no, from a political science perspective, one of the first questions we would ask is, well, where does democratic backsliding occur? In which member states? And we would use empirical data, expert interviews, like the VDEM Democracy Index, and we would look at in what at what moments in time, no, did democratic backsliding occur in what countries? We would, for example, find, no, that democratic quality in Hungary has quite deteriorated over the last years. Next, we would ask from a political science perspective, who actually shields 
autocrats that engage in democratic backsliding, you know, autocratic forces, who shields them, who has an interest um, perhaps in supporting them. And we would come to the question, for example, who owes autocrats a favor? We could analyze um, the election of the von der Leyen Commission. No, Ursula von der Leyen is now commission president of the European Union, but she wouldn't ever have become commission president were it not for 12 votes of MEPs she got from um, um, Orban's Fidesz party. Yeah? So there is a question of whether she owes a favor no, to Viktor Orban. And last, we could also look at why is it so hard for the democratic opposition to win? Think of Hungary again. There are democratic opposition forces like the Momentum, Liberal Democratic Momentum Party. But these forces have, um, have little financial resources and there are certain institutions in the EU that prohibit other forces from outside the country, from the European Union level, to support these forces. Why does it matter so much? Clearly, if the European Union ceases to be a union of rule of law abiding democracy, the union becomes think simply unthinkable. Mutual trust must exist between and among member states for the EU not to unravel. And at the center of this mutual trust are the values of liberty and democracy mentioned in Article 2 TEU, which form part as the European Court of Justice has held part of the very foundations of the European legal order. On the next slide, so what are the remedies against backsliding? Of course, you might first think about a political remedy, Article 7. Article 7 says that the European Council, acting by unanimity, may determine the existence of a serious and persistent breach of Article 2 values. However, and then that requires qualified majority voting to suspend voting rights. However, it cannot be expected. Um, unanimity cannot be expected when there are more than one state which violate fundamental rights. So the court has said that um, has protected judicial independence and the irremovability of judges. However, rule of law threats are wider than this. They may attach to NGOs or think of the Central European University. On the next slide, we see that the legislature has stepped in. So there is a conditionality mechanism according to which EU governments in breach of the rule of law risk losing access to EU funds. Think of the pandemic recovery fund. Quality, qualified majority voting is sufficient and this mechanism covers systemic breaches of the rule of law. And in addition, the commission ensures that the final beneficiaries such as you, for example, students, or NGOs will still receive the due amounts of money and are not being penalized. But then uh, there's also the question, how does the EU tackle uh, rule of law and practice aside from instruments such as those just outlined by Oliver? Now, one way of understanding this is to look quite closely at um, instruments, reports and practice um, as it emerges on the EU level. Um, so in September last year, the European Commission uh, released a communication entitled the 2020 Rule of Law Report. And the aim of this report was to look at key developments across the EU and across member states. It's conceived as a new uh, preventative tool, but as part of the new annual uh, um, European Rule of Law a mechanism which brings together EU institutions, member states, national parliaments, civil society and um, other stakeholders on the rule of law. And it, the report itself was drafted together with uh, member states and in consultation with around 200 um, stakeholders. As one of the pledges von der Leyen had to make in exchange for the political support um, she got and was expected to offer basis for sanctioning um, democratic backsliders. Um, it was a it was a communication though, so these have no legally 
binding powers. Um, but civil society will play a really important role here, and this is what this slide is, is pointing to. On the one hand, of course, um, the very existence of independent civil society groups are often threatened in countries where the rule of law is debilitated, such as, for instance, in Hungary's 2017 uh, transparency law, which was ruled unlawful by the Court of, um, of Justice of the European Union last year. And also because um, civil society groups can urge and inform EU action, uh, for instance, through stakeholder consultations by mobilising citizens engaging with lawmakers. So at UCL, we will also consider um, how some of these um, uh, work in practice, some of these mechanisms, and we will also hear from associated staff uh, who are themselves engaged in practice-led teaching um, modules um, to talk about their experience. Great. And um, now you heard already quite a lot about our offer. We will say more about this in a minute. But first, we want to quickly look at your expectations with regard to graduate study. And um, there I will just show you some of the results we have just collected. And um, for example, here, are you interested in postgraduate study on the U? Most of you are. Um, and what would you prefer? Yeah a degree integrating different disciplines. And that's very much also what we are offering. We are doing a political science degree, but with a lot of, inf with a, with a lot of um, elements from laws, with a lot of elements from the practice world, and with a lot also with some elements from economics and from cultural perspectives. Um, how much would you like to learn in each discipline? Um, and here we see, yeah, you are in. You, you very much want to learn in political science, but you also want to learn in law, in history, and in cultural studies. And this is very much also what we offer you at UCL. Um, so let's look a bit more closely um, at our offer. And there, um, Uta will, yeah, go to the next slide. You can come and study with us the MSc in European Politics and Policy this fall. Um, this course is really like a fundamental course on European integration, the European Union and politics in the EU member states, as well as the external relations of the EU, with a core course where you really learn everything about the EU institutions, the European Union institutions and politics with legal perspectives, with political science perspectives. Um, and with economics perspectives. Then a practice module, Uta will say more about this in a minute. And then you specialize either in policy making or in comparative politics of the member states. You have methods, quantitative and qualitative methods. We have like one of the strongest methods groups in the country um, at UCL. And um, you have two electives of your choice. So they can also be from other departments. They can be from laws. You can specialize in EU law if you want this through these electives. And then you um, write a 10,000 words dissertation on a topic of your choice. So to tell you a little bit more about the practice module, um, as I said before, um, one distinctive approach with ECL is that we want to bring you, in addition to outstanding academic um, research um, on, on the EU, a practice-led experience. And the way that we do this is, is through the practice module, which is conceived as a series of conversations with guest speakers. And you can see to the right some of our associated staff. There's Carlos Modas, who until recently was the EU Commissioner for Research and Innovation. There is Agata Gostinska Ayagopovska, who used to be at the Center for European Reform and is now at Apple, or Nicola Brewer, um, uh, previously Vice Provost International at UCL, but also um, a former Director of Europe at the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office in the UK, among a whole range of others. Now, they will lead the classes with you. And there will, in addition, be an intensive a master class in Reading Week which gives us a day and a half um, of intense working led again by practitioners. Um, and not only will the um, 
the perspective be practitioner led. But uh, your assessment for this module will also be uh, one that's uh, based on formats that are actually used in practice beyond um, academia. That might include um, you are being required to draft uh, background papers to prepare for the sessions that you will then lead Q and A's on prepare policy briefings, publishable posts um, for, for blogs, legal opinions or such. And this practice module will follow very, very closely in terms of academic content, the core course that is being co-taught. Um, and therefore, there is a sense that um, we will really engage with the different um, parts of the academic teaching from an, a practice-led perspective. Um, We've talked a lot about the course. Let us very briefly also talk about UCL. Now, UCL is one of the best universities in the world, and uh, pretty much every university at this fair will probably tell you this, and uh, rightly so. But UCL, which is currently ranked um, first for research strength in the UK, um, is also, uh, I'd like to consider itself something uh, slightly uh, different, a bit of an outlier, an unruly presence, if you like. Um, not only because it really was the first university in England to welcome students, regardless of their religious, social background, or their um, gender, or because it's the first to have a fully open access university press. But its ethos really is to combine outstanding academic research um, with disruptive uh, thinking, a willingness to do things differently and to really focus on the real world impact of uh, some of our um, research and the cross-disciplinary ethos that we've tried to bring across in this presentation really pervades all that UCL is doing. Perhaps I think it also goes for the way that we approach students' learning um, in that is that we don't want to teach you what to think. We want to really teach you how to think, how to think critically, um, how to go about your work. Um, we're also probably rightly called um, London's global university. Um, we have uh, one of the highest proportion of international and EU um, citizens among our staff and our students. And of course, um, we are situated right in the heart of one of the world's and one of Europe's most uh, vibrant cities. And it is with a certain longing that I, I look at this picture and we can't wait to go out there and be back in the back in the city again. Um, it is a wonderful place therefore also to be uh, physically. And um, we want to encourage you to get in touch if you want to know more. Um, the chap here in the straw hat, by the way, is Jeremy Bentham, uh, uh, the philosopher of utilitarianism, who was uh, a founding inspiration for UCL and who is a, a literal presence um, in the university, which you will discover if you come and join us. So please do get in touch um, if you've got um, questions after this or follow the links here. And I'll stop sharing now so we can move on to the Q&A. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Uta. I just before I start with the Q and A, I just want to highlight that we also have a chat session directly following this. So if we don't manage to answer each and everyone's question, please just move over to the chat with us, and there we can tackle all kind of questions in detail. But I will start on the questions in the chat, and there I have Macy. I hope I pronounce this correctly. Do you have to bring an area of your main interest? into studying the EU, like healthcare or education. Uh, I don't know whether one of you wants to take that. Otherwise, I can take it. Oliver, Uta. You start. OK, I start. Well, I think it's nice if you come with an area, with a main area of interest. And especially if you talk about like healthcare or education, um, these are definitely like also policy areas where we at the Department of Political Science and the School of Public Policy would have modules no, that look at the policy making process comparatively, how is it in health, how is it in education, where we have EU um, related modules on policy making in these areas. Generally, if you are interested in um, the policy, into the, in the policy realm of the EU, I think being at the School for Public Policy is a quite big advantage. But 
if you don't have a particular main interest, I'm sure we will give you all the opportunities to find that. And there you are benefiting at UCL, not only from the big department of political science with a lot of different um, focus on democracy, um, uh, on comparative politics of the EU, um, on uh, lobbying in the EU, but also from the other departments, from EU, from laws, from EU law, you may specialize in that, the European Institute Institute, you may want to get more to the practice uh, side of things, or you can also take, go to, if you have Eastern European interests, you can go to the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies and take a module there. This is the big advantage of, of, of a big university. If you don't come with an interest, we will make you interested in something. If you come with a specific interest, we have an offer for you. Mm -hmm. And I would just add, come with an open mind. And if you are interested in health, Care, then there is healthcare law as well. So it's uh, it exists at UCL laws. In fact, maybe one of the I think just I mean Chris sort of pointed towards that, but one of the really important bits about UCL is that it is such a big multidisciplinary university that you really do have um, a great sense of. Uh, expertise in areas that may not initially look like they're to do with European politics and policy, but you will actually then find out that the experts uh, and uh, the expertise they offer um, can relate and give you a really deep down sense in a particular area that you can then relate to your studies, such as, for example, in, in energy, in transport, in public health, um, etc. Yeah. Great. Then we have um, Emma. Do you have to apply with a research plan for the dissertation and contact potential supervisors prior to applying? Um, perhaps I take that. Um, this um, you don't have to, no? Uh, many students come into the MSC you know, with a clear plan, for example, to do a PhD afterwards, and they may have some research plan or some topic. But that's not the expectation. That's great if you have that, and then you have a personal, um, a personal tutor from day one you can talk to about that, you can develop this proposal with. But the real dissertation process um, at our department starts at the end of, um, uh, starts before Christmas or in the beginning um, of, of, of your second, um, uh, in, in January or February, when you have to find a dissertation proposal. So you are broadly outlining what your dissertation shall be about. And you do this together with your personal tutor you have been assigned. And then you get a specialized supervisor allocated who is an expert um, in, in, in some of the uh, issues that you want to tackle. And then you will meet uh, with him or her and will develop your proposal over the rest of the year and um, will be supervised by this person. Yeah, we'll try to help you to discover your own project and to find your own interests. Great. Um, then we have Maya Rovis. What are the key elements you are looking for in a student? Why did you personally choose this field? And do you feel like you are fulfilling your life purpose? So <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to take that? Well, some of us might, might say the, the field chose us, but uh, we ended up in these fields by accident, um, mixture between love and accident. So um, I think that's happened. You cannot plan everything in advance. So um, you will, when you come, you can can come with open with an open mind and see what interests you and then you can specialize in fact i think eu studies um and particularly as, as such a big university um they actually allow you to to really develop your own sense of of your personal journey if you like if i may as a, as a personal example is that i've come much more from a, a cultural studies and historical background and through um a keen interest in theory and political theory moved into uh, the european studies space where i've then spent uh, many years now working very happily but one of the reasons i think um it is so exciting is that you actually um, end up talking to so many others. You end up talking to historians, to philosophers, to legal specialists, um, to political scientists, to policy wonks and nerds all across the spectrum. And um, you forge your own way there, but it is a very fluid environment um, and that makes it intellectually very attractive. And the more you do this also, I think um, it also gives you a chance to really work on your career path afterwards. Mm. 
we have a lot we have a lot left so I, I will try to tackle some of it but I just wanted to say what are key elements you are looking for in a student I just say one thing there curiosity critical perspective you want to challenge stuff you want to learn um, you are excited about things you are curious this is what I would just um, put in. But generally, no, we are open no, to everyone. And everyone is different. And some people are more shy. Some people are more extroverted. That's all fine and all very welcome and all contributes to our dense economic community. Uh, so, and a social community, sorry. Then we have Maroina uh, Aspen. Are there examples of places students have done internships? Well, if you are at UCL for a 10 or 11 months masters, there will be little time left during this you know, to do an internship. So most of the internships people are doing, they are either doing before or afterwards. Many do, for example, a stage at the, um, in, in Brussels, or they go to Brussels think tanks afterwards, do an internship for half a year or a year, get a proper job. After that, we have a lot of people working in Brussels at PR agency, uh, agencies, at the European institutions, in, the, in, in directorate generals. We have people working um, now with uh, the UK in a Changing Europe program, just a graduate from last year now is um, advising the director there. So people who stay in the UK, many people going to Brussels in all kinds of fields. Would you be guided by tutors about what area you could specialize in? Yes. Is it best to narrow down a certain area of the youth throughout your whole study so that when getting a certain job, you feel you can specialize in something? I don't know whether one of you has a view on that. I just wanted to add first that um, there is also the European Court of Justice to which we have close oh, yeah. connections. So if you want to um, become a referendaire at the, uh, with, a, uh, with a judge, I mean, there are precedents for this. And uh, so, so this is also a possibility. Yeah. Um, and in general, in terms of specialization, I think my personal view on this is, and I don't know, Uta, whether you um, disagree or Oliver, whether you disagree, but my personal view is there, there are people that specialize a lot and it's fine for them and they find a job, but there are also so many people that do not specialize. And as generalists, later they find in, on the job, no, they specialize during the job, no, in the first years of their job, or they never specialize. They always stay like generalists because they are in a job where you need general skills if you're working for an MEP or so, no, he might not necessarily want you to know everything about a certain topic, but know, know something about the whole legislative yeah. agenda and what is coming and be able to get into new uh, stuff. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I would back that up. Um, I said earlier that we try to uh, teach you how to think, not what to think. And part of that is that you want to give you the skills and the methodologies mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the multifaceted understanding of how the EU works and how the policy processes mm -hmm. work and the laws work. Um, because to my mind, at least, the master's level is too early to start a narrow specialization. You may want to um, take this year in order to find out what interests you most. Um, but don't start it, I think, with an, a, a clear sense of, of narrow specialization. Take the opportunity to dive into very different areas and then explore that, um, as you said, on your career path. Yeah, we want to turn you into great thinkers. So you, we want you to have an understanding of the core normative political even philosophical problems underlying the EU. With that, you can easily delve into specialisms. How many students do you admit for the political science master's degree per year? So in this, this is a small program, European politics and policy. You can expect that you will be a cohort of around 20 students. Sometimes we are more towards like 20, sometimes we are 25, but this is around it. In general, the political science departments has hundreds um, of uh, students, so we are more like in the region of 400, and you are really in one of the smaller, very intimate programs here, and you will have much more um, staff exposure than in some of the other programs. Um, and then we have, um, hi everyone, thank you taking the time to elaborate on the degrees opportunities at the Department of Political Science. I was wondering if we could apply to a master's with a non-social science bachelor's degree. Yes. You can do that. You, we, we are excited to have people that come with different perspectives. 
clearly that will be some challenge at some point in the beginning. But um, usually I have people who come especially from the humanities who have never done any social science before and end up on the dean's list as the best students in this course. So that happened just last year. So I think there is no barrier there. Um, hello, I was wondering if your school also did economics and policy of energy and environment MSc and whether this master's was very integrated in the political science department. They are perhaps come to our stand and ask this question again, um, because they are, I think, the recruitment side can, can better answer that. Hello, I was wondering how many languages do you need to be fluent in to be successful in EU studies? Who wants to take this? This is the last one. 27 languages. <laughs> <laughs> there is no minimum, uh, well, there's no maximum, put it that way. Um, I think, as you know, if you're aware, for the EU institutions, you need a certain minimum of languages, which I believe is, oh, somebody will have to correct me on this, is it's, I think you need to speak at least um, uh, two of the official languages. Um, uh, is that right? Oh, I, I, but in certain, I think the, the wonderful thing is you start picking them up. As you may have noticed, uh, none of us are English native speakers. All of us um, speak various other languages um, on the side. Um, there is no maximum number, but I think in terms of, of minimum, um, in addition to, to English, it is very useful, certainly to, to pick up at least one other uh, language. And as to, perspective. as to the other question about environmental environmentalism, I mean, there is a strong strength at UCL laws on um, climate change studies and environmental law. Great. Yeah, I think that were um, all your questions. I hope I haven't missed anyone. But if we have missed anyone, please, uh, and if you have more questions, please just move with us. Um, to the other chat room, and there um, we can answer more of your questions. Thanks a lot um, for attending this. If you have any more questions beyond the fair, please drop us an email, um, admissions at polsky pgt um, uclac.uk, or you can uh, search us on the internet and write us individually. Um, you can also visit the stand, now UCL stand. We are here all rest for all rest of the day.